Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm your host, Dennis Ward. Our guest this week is policy analyst and former candidate for the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Russ Dibo. Russ is a member of the Mohawk Nation of Ganawage. He's been active in Indigenous politics since he was a teenager and was at the Wounded Knee standoff in 1973. He's worked for the National Indian Brotherhood and the Assembly of First Nations. Russ also worked on the Liberal Party's Aboriginal platform in the 1993 election, which I'm hoping we'll have some time to chat about. And he's also been dead set against Justin Trudeau Liberal government's planned recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights framework. And Russ, that's where I'd like to start with. And uh, maybe if you could give us a, a sense of what it is about this proposed framework that you are, are so against. Well, you know, I have a broader uh, interpretation of the framework uh, that it, it encompasses or includes uh, the massive changes to the federal structure, uh, policies and laws that they're promoting coming out of their uh, 2015 campaign promises. To me, that's what constitutes the framework. Um, the Assembly of First Nations just adopted a resolution rejecting the legislative framework, which was a proposed bill that the Trudeau government wanted to introduce into Parliament before Christmas. <clears throat> but I, <coughs> excuse me, I view that as being uh, too narrow because uh, when you look at everything that they've done for the past three years since forming the government, they've, um, you know, imposed 10 principles on Indigenous relationships, which are basically like cre preconditions. And those are based on like the doctrine of discovery, the uh, the Constitution Act 1867, where the federal and provincial governments you know, will continue to dominate over us. They're uh, undermining the UN Declaration in those 10 principles. And then they announced that unilaterally, despite having agreements with AFN. And um, also that they're dissolving the Department of Indian Affairs and creating two new federal departments. Mm -hmm. So they're doing major restructuring of the, uh, the federal uh, government and that has serious implications for us. Uh, we should have a say if we're going to have this nation-to-nation -nation relationship that they promised and this reconciliation process, it should be jointly developed, not unilateral. But those are two examples of unilateral actions they've taken. And um, even this fiscal relations process that they are doing with AFN, supposedly jointly, um, seems that the federal government has the pen on a lot of this development. So these are all major national initiatives, plus these negotiations. You know, they have um, what's called a bilateral mechanism, which is a federal cabinet committee. That's secret. Um, they're doing this law and policy review. They were to supposedly decolonize their laws, but that was all in secret. And Jody Wilson-Raybould, the justice minister, headed that up. But now they've reorganized themselves and they have a reconciliation cabinet committee headed up by Jim Carr, uh, from Winnipeg here, uh, who was the minister that talked about, you know, the rule of law and perhaps using the police or military to get the pipeline built. Right. He's chairing that reconciliation committee, and now he's the minister of international uh, diversification and trade, I believe. And um, um, that's that's what bothers me is this has been done in a top-down approach in secret, bypassing and misleading our people because a lot of this is being done through slogans, you know, um, like nation to nation and reconciliation. Well, Trudeau is saying that the legislation would recognize indigenous governments, ensure full and meaningful implementation of treaties, resolve disputes, uh, provide greater trust. Do these things uh, not sound good? Well, based on my experience, you know, I've seen this picture before. When we look at, uh, you know, the Red Book uh, from 1993, uh, they promised to act on the premise that the inherent right to self-government was already included in Section 35 of Canada's Constitution. But when they formed a majority government under Jean Chrétien, they unilaterally imposed the 1995 uh, self-government policy, uh, which says what's on the table and what's not on the table. So they defined self-government, or the inherent right, unilaterally through a federal policy. And I see them repeating the same thing now with self-determination. They want to unilaterally define um, our right to self-determination um, through a Canadian definition that they're developing unilaterally uh, through all these national processes I, I mentioned you know and actions that they've taken and um, our people have had nothing to do with it and don't know anything about it 
you know, even APTN, I understand, did a poll and 80 some percent didn't mm. know what the framework was. Right. And I'm not surprised because they're doing it in secret and they're doing it through public relations, you know, trying to trying to say nice things to us, but they're doing something different than what they're saying. So what does this rejection uh, by the AFN of the framework mean, do you think? Well, myself, I, I think it was kind of meaningless because they already announced they were going to delay it um, for now. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a majority uh, government, a majority parliament, so although they say they, they could delay it until after the next uh, federal election, the reality is they could bring it forward at any time and ram it through because they have the, the majority to do it. <clears throat> and as I said, that's only the legislation they were proposing to do, which, you know, by the way, is recognition and implementation of rights, but it's rights defined unilaterally by the federal government. They, uh, they're basically weaponizing uh, federal recognition. They're saying you'd have to go through a process of um, being uh, recognized as indigenous nations or collectives, whatever those are, and there would be an advisory committee uh, helping them uh, to develop the, the rules for being federally recognized. Because the position the government takes is Indian Act bans are non-self-governing because they're under the Indian Act and the minister and the department are governing their, you know, the reserve lands, the monies, uh, the programs, you know, uh, so they view them as being non-self-governing. The only way to be uh, self-governing is if you sign a modern uh, comprehensive claims agreement, you know, a modern treaty, um, a self-government agreement, or if there's legislation, enabling legislation, for example, the Anishinaabek Education Act that they passed last December. Mm -hmm. Those are the three paths to becoming a federally recognized indigenous government. And according to their proposed uh, legislation that AFN just rejected through a resolution, uh, they said these governments would have the powers of a natural person, meaning like a corporation. And that, that's language that goes back to the First Nations Governance Act under Kretchen in um, the early 2000s. So they're recycling a lot of these ideas from uh, the federal bureaucracy. So basically turning nations into municipalities? Bands into municipalities um, or a group of bands uh, could be a corporation because that's one of the things they're saying. They're putting $100 million into reconstituting nations, they call it. But in my view, really, it's just trying to get the smaller bands to amalgamate uh, into larger um, you know, management units to deliver programs and services mm -hmm. on, um, you know, a larger scale. Do you see this legislation coming to pass? Like, you know, the AFN has put out this uh, resolution rejecting it. The, the federal government kind of not saying much whether this thing's being paused. They're hinting at that it won't come before the next election or at least this year. Do you, do you see this legislation going through at some point? Actually, the Prime Minister came and made a speech at the AFN meeting on December 4th and, you know, at the end he said they're going to continue. Uh, basically, what I heard him say is they're going to continue with this, but they're going to talk more, but they're still going to continue. And um, they have 70 plus um, what they call recognition tables across the country for First Nations, Métis and Inuit groups. And uh, Minister Bennett did post that um, half of the Indian Act bans in the country are at one of those 70 tables. And those tables, the outputs of those tables, are what they're hoping to use in drafting the legislation, you know, which would be basically um, a one-window approach for all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit issues. That's what they were proposing. So it, it could well be after the next federal election, if they have another majority, they may try and push it through, you know, if they have a minority government, they may try and, um, you know, continue just with the pieces, you know, trying to get agreements at these tables mm -hmm. rather than wrapping it up into one national law. So, you know, we saw the rally, uh, a, a fairly sizable rally on Parliament Hill recently uh, against the framework. Where do things go in terms of, of the opposition now, do you think? Well, I think it's a little tougher because um, with the proposed legislation, there was clearly something to point to. You know, there, there was a September 10th overview document that laid out what would be in the proposed legislation, and, and that was pretty scary when you start reading it, you know, including the idea of, you know, basically turning um, bans into corporations. Um, now that they say they're delaying that, it's, it's more diffuse. It's harder to put the finger on because they're doing all the pieces. They're doing the national uh, fiscal relations process. Actually, there's two. 
There's one for Indian Act bans and one for bans who signed self-government agreements um, to fiscal relations. Um, they're still going ahead with the restructuring of the federal department. Um, there's a lot, uh, you see the thing you have to understand about the creation of the two, new, two departments, they've done that through an order in council. So they can operate without the law for now. But really if you go to any of the uh, offices across the country, including here in Manitoba, the regional director general is working for the Department of Indigenous Services, Minister Jane Philpott, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the, um, the whole Ministry of Crown uh, Indigenous Relations is being operated out of headquarters and most of the staff across the country are dealing with programs and services under Philpot. So it's pretty mysterious what's going on in that other department which is dealing with rights. You know, the programs and services are divided, but you know, eventually they want groups to sign on to modern agreements under this new department. And they already have about 30 groups that have already signed modern treaties or self-government agreements. But that's where they want the other Indian Act bands to go is to follow that model. In fact, um, you know, um, they said that in 2016, Jim Carr said they were going to do a Canadian definition of the UN Declaration, and um, Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould said we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We already have uh, modern treaties and uh, self-government agreements and legislation. And she was pointing to the uh, fiscal uh, relations, uh, the First Nations Fiscal Institutions Act and the First Nations Land Management Act and um, basically the additions to reserve uh, policy which they're now legislating uh, as examples of what they call creating indigenous institutions when really they're federally created institutions um, but those are um, institutions they're using to move bands out of the Indian Act basically in a transitional way until they're ready to sign self-government agreements or modern treaties. Lots uh, going on there, Russ. Uh, we're going to have to step aside for a quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here with Russ Daimo on Face to Face. Welcome back to you, Face to Face. Our guest this week is. Okay, wait. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is policy analyst and former candidate for National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Russ Daiwo. And Russ, in your concession speech at the AFN in July, you warned there would be consequences for re-electing Perry Bellegarde as National Chief. What, what type of consequences were you speaking of? Well, I was speaking of the consequences that our people were getting fed up, you know, across the country. Um, the colonial system, um, you know, is, is making our conditions worse. Um, you know, our children are being apprehended in, uh, by child welfare agencies in, in uh, record numbers. You know, it's basically continuing the cycle of moving them from, from the families and communities into, you know, the juvenile system and into prisons. Mm -hmm. And so the social problems that we're seeing across the country, the problems we're seeing with, the, uh, with uh, Tina Fontaine and quote and bushy, you know, the problems with the justice system are all f problems with the structure of Canada of colonialism and racism. Um, the consequences I'm talking about is, you know, our people are increasingly demanding fundamental change, not incremental change, and they're continuing to, to act on it at, at a local level. Um, but also, I think you're going to see, um, as the government continues to push, and AFN and chief and council systems continue to push without changes, uh, there'll be more and more pushback from the people demanding change. And the United Nations Declaration itself says that there should be change. You know, Article 18 says Indigenous peoples have a right to decision making um, through their own Indigenous institutions. And bands and band councils are not Indigenous institutions. And that's what um, chief and councils need to start looking at is how do they develop, you know, structures, constitutions, institutions uh, locally and within the nations that reflect what the people want involve them in the decision making. 
And if they don't do that, um, there's a new generation of youth coming up that are, are fed up and they'll start taking more action, I think. We have uh, some of your concession speech. Uh, let's hear a little bit of that. This organization is basically controlled by uh, the Trudeau government. And uh, I'm saying to the people who are watching, uh, it's really up to you now because it's clear that this organization is not going to reform itself. It's going to have to happen from the outside. And I'm not going anywhere, so I'm going to be working to help reform the organization and also the still stopping the Trudeau legislation in a different role, but I still intend to fight to do that. Russ, as we mentioned, you're, uh, you used to work for the AFN, the National Indian Brotherhood as well. well. Why do you feel that the AFN is controlled by the Trudeau government? Well, for one thing, they're pumping tens of millions of dollars into the organization and um, any kind of arm's length relationship is gone. You know, AFN is used by the federal government. It's like a pendulum. When they have a national chief that's in there that's working with them, they work through the AFN. And you can't really get anything done locally or regionally unless you go through AFN. That's the point we're at now. But, uh, for example, when Ovin Mekrity was national chief, uh, Ron Irwin, who was the Minister of Indian Affairs under Jean Chrétien, was doing pilot projects. He, in fact, did the Manitoba Framework Initiative with Phil Fontaine. He signed it here to dismantle Indian Affairs. And all of that was basically to bypass Ovid and what Ovid was pushing for and, and pushing for recognition of rights, uh, you know, at the national level. So the federal government uses AFN when it wants to and, and ignores them when they want to. Right now they're using them. And, um, you know, it's all based on the Indian Act system. AFN is really <clears throat> made up of the chief and council systems across the country. So <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, people came to me and said, well, you know, we need to vote for national chief. I said, why would you want to do that? It's not a government. Where you really need to push for change is, is locally in your community because we need to get out of the Indian Act system but not be controlled by the government on how we do that. Because right now the government says, well, if you want out of the Indian Act system or to go beyond the Indian Act, you have to negotiate a self-government agreement with us based on that self-government policy. And now they're trying to do it through this framework where they're trying to control and manage us um, through federal structures and federal funding. They're basically, in my view, they turn self-government into a federal program that you have to apply for. I see them repeating that with self-determination, trying to turn that into a federal program we have to apply for. But that's not what self-determination is. Self-determination uh, is supposed to be about us being able to choose um, our destiny, our path, you know, based on our freedom, our liberty, uh, according to international standards. The minimum standard set out in the UN Declaration, which Trudeau claims he's implementing, but he's left the provinces out. You know, we have to take the provinces on because they're the ones that have the lands, territories, and resources. And even in the self-government policy of the federal government from 1995, if you want to do anything that touches the federal jurisdiction, they have a veto. You have to have an agreement from them, even for something as fundamental as child welfare. That's why uh, right now this child welfare legislation that they're they're promoting, I haven't seen the text of it, but I understand they're talking to them for the first time saying you could have agreements on reserve without the provinces. Well, that would be a fundamental shift because prior to this, you always had to have the provinces agreeing. Russ, we are going to have to step aside for a quick break, but I just want to touch briefly on this. Uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of, you said uh, yourself, that you felt the election was was tainted in part because of the meeting that uh, Minister Bennett uh, took with the Alberta chiefs. Uh, there was, a, for those of us who were there or watching, there was uh, quite a lot of action on the floor. Do you still feel that this election uh, was tainted due to that meeting? Well, not just that meeting. I mean, the whole liberal influence on that day, I thought, was definitely wrong to have the minister meeting with chiefs' caucuses while voting was going on. That was totally inappropriate. I, I still believe she should have been sanctioned for that um, in some way because um, it's her department that's funding the organization. You know, there's a total conflict of interest there. And all that did is illustrate to me what I said was true, that the organization is controlled by the, the Liberal government. And, you know, um, but it had been going on for some time. You know, right back to... Um, March 1st and 2nd when they had a special assembly on legislation with the Prime Minister coming and the ministers. So, you know, they'd been um, working on the chiefs for some time to say, you know, 
if you want to keep working with us, you need to elect somebody in that we can work with. Sorry, Russ, I, I got to hold you there as we do have to step aside for another quick break, but we'll be right back to continue the conversation here on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Russ Dybo. And uh, Russ, you uh, in the past have accused Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of continuing the agenda of Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Do you uh, not feel, I guess, that things have gotten better uh, in the almost four years that the Trudeau Liberals have been governing? Well, I'll concede that on programs and services, you know, they put in $17 billion dollars in new um, programs and services. Mind you, they back-ended um, a few billion of that uh, until after the next mm -hmm. federal election. But um, they have come up with, with more money. But um, that's Indian Act dependency dollars, which, which are needed, but aren't changing the system. And a lot of that's going to be eaten up by the bureaucracy, both the First Nations bureaucracy and the, and the, the federal bureaucracy. Um, so I still think that you know there's definitely room for improvement and also on the the side of rights you know remember I said they created two departments on the issue of rights they're very they're very manipulative and in my view they haven't changed the objectives that Harper was pursuing which is to municipalize uh, bans you know um, and um, yeah I think that um, there's been some some improvement program wise but not in terms of rights Russ, we're unfortunately down to our last minute here, but uh, the National Chief recently said, you know, and it's been well documented, First Nations played a, a pretty big role in the last federal election, uh, having a role in flipping 22 ridings. What do you see happening, I guess just briefly, uh, in this upcoming election? Well, um, there was a lot of hope after the Harper decade, and uh, Trudeau made a lot of nice-sounding promises, but I think the red pixie dust has worn off, and... Uh, you might see um, First Nations voting for another party, uh, um, perhaps the NDP, I don't know. But um, I don't know if they're going to come out as much or even vote like they did in the first round because I think there's a lot of disappointment amongst our people this time around. Russ, unfortunately, we do have to leave it there, but uh, this episode took a long time to pull together. We've been working on this together for a while, so I'm glad you were able to make it here. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's show. We're always looking for new guests, so if you have any suggestions, please email us at news at aptn.ca. This show and past episodes are always available as podcasts. You can find those at aptn.ca slash face-to-face podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Dennis Ward. <laughs>